be uh, using uh, this EVPF technology uh, within cloud native works, uh, cloud native space uh, uh, to explore more around networking observability and security. So I'll be mainly talking about uh, how we would we would use EVPF uh, along with a product called Cilium and how we would integrate Cilium with uh, Azure Kubernetes services and provide uh, uh, an understanding of uh, how the networking would look like uh, using this technology. Uh, I'm Naneshwar Babu. Uh, I work as a senior cloud engineer uh, at Mantle Group, and I work extensively on cloud and DevOps uh, DevOps techno technologies. And I do everything around uh, Azure and GitHub, uh, and I will be helping customers with their uh, regular cloud migrations and DevOps journey. And uh, like as a um, opportunity, like I look at every opportunity to, to automate everything that is possible, which is manual at every stage. So uh, uh, before going on to the actual talk, uh, like it's always difficult to uh, get audience onto the uh, rhythm soon after the lunch. So I'll just talk of, I'll start with a few questions. Like how many of you have worked with, are working with Kubernetes in this room? Okay, and how many of you are working with uh, uh, Kubernetes networking? Again, okay, sure. And how many of you are working with EBPF? Uh, perfect, yeah, I have one audience who can, uh, Work with work, work along with me in the uh, in this journey. So uh, for today's agenda, like I'll be starting with talking about uh, basic container networking, uh, like how the how everything clubs into together in a traditional container networking space, and then I'll move on to explaining a bit about EVPF uh, technology. Like I'll not give a, a detailed description because EVPF itself is a, a technology that needs at least a day to understand like how everything works and uh, like how everything uh, fits in within the Linux uh, kernel space. Uh, then I'll move on to uh, explaining a bit about Cilium. Uh, Cilium is again a, a, a product I would say by Isovalent, but like Cilium is, I, I would say Cilium as a, a complete technology stack which gives uh, networking, observability, and security. Um, all of these integrated into one product. And then I'll move on to uh, uh, more of Azure, uh, to talk more about Azure, uh, mainly to start with uh, AKS with the default networking. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction about like how the default networking looks like. And then I will move on to uh, actually uh, demo, like explaining about AKS with Cilium. And uh, uh, like while explaining AKS with Cilium, it's, it's more good to explain about uh, the concept as well as a bit of demo to understand, to show you like how everything works. Like here, like I'll also be talking about net, uh, few network policies uh, where we will, I will show you like how do you route the traffic from a pod uh, to a pod to a content, like pod to a service and then pod in different namespaces and then a port from egress, uh, from port to egress. And I will explain how do we observe this technology uh, using uh, another technology within Cilium for Hubble uh, to understand like how, how can we use Hubble to observe the flow of uh, traffic. Uh, here, uh, yeah, uh, uh, with container networking, like our vanilla Kubernetes cluster provides a networking layer uh, allowing us to expose our ports with the help of services. Um, and it makes sense uh, to refer to a service rather than a pod, uh, because a pod is an ephemeral device, as everyone knows, and it can be destroyed at any given point of time. So uh, let's take a, uh, a break for a little while, and le let's go back to understand like what, how does an, a traditional networking looks like, or, or a container networking looks like. Like as you probably already uh, know, when we deploy a service, uh, with a select, we deploy a service with a selector, and uh, that will match all the parts that is part of a service. Uh, and once that service is created, then uh, the Kubernetes is also creating an endpoint object that will match the various parts of service uh, with their IP addresses. Um, and endpoints are important uh, because uh, there is a component called kube proxy within uh, the networking uh, uh, container networking space uh, that will utilize the information to create the right networking uh, net right networking rule so a kube proxy is a crucial component within the uh, kubernetes networking uh, so that will be running on each node of a cluster uh, it will also make the routing of traffic to the right pod 
um, in fact, like to the right IP address within the net, uh, within the container space. Uh, Qpoxy is on running on the node and will create an IP address, uh, IP table rule uh, for each uh, service. Uh, the IP table will take the service and the pod and redirect the traffic to one of the pod IP address. And for and here, like, but how does the uh, Cube, uh, Kubernetes resolve the name uh, of our service. Like if we have various services and we have various pods uh, within the cluster. So how does it uh, understand like which service to map to which name? So that's where we use uh, Cube DNS. Uh, like in uh, like in uh, in few uh, in few ways, like we use Cube DNS, but like also we most likely we also use Core DNS that will have one DNS role per service, and then Cube Proxy will resolve that service name into the IP, IP address. With this mechanism, any part of the cluster can access to any service, except if we filter the traffic by creating a network policy. Um, uh, as explained, uh, Kubernetes network relies a lot on IP tables and uh, uh, the Qproxy. So it is good until like we have a, a medium-sized cluster, but like it becomes difficult when we have too many IP uh, too many services, too many parts to manage. That's where like uh, it'll start creating uh, too many IP tables for every like every uh, cluster, and like you will have too many IP, IP tables and too many um, IP addresses to manage. So that's where it becomes very difficult to manage these IP tables along with Kube proxy. Uh, Kube proxy. So how do we resolve this problem? Uh, that's where uh, the eBPF technology comes into picture. Uh, eBPF. Uh, like it, it was a technology that existed way back in 1992, uh, where it is called as a Buckley packet filter. Uh, originally, yeah, it was created in 1992 uh, to analyze uh, network filter, uh, to analyze and filter network traffic. And uh, what is eBPF? Like eBPF is an extended BPF that was created uh, after the Linux kernel 3.8 version. So I think such approach uh, wouldn't work. Uh, be uh, okay. Like in a kernel, normally, like when you're making any uh, changes to the kernel, uh, uh, you need to, like it's difficult in a kernel community, like uh, you need to propose your change and like that would take uh, many, like a more time to uh, go and uh, convince the maintainer and get it approved. But like here, uh, like, uh, like I think such approach wouldn't work because every time you want to make a change to kernel, like you want to wait for a long time to uh, uh, get your patch approved or get your uh, program approved. So. Uh, you would, uh, in that case, um, it will be difficult for you to um, make changes. And also, like, you can use your own kernel and you can uh, start deploying uh, your changes to your own kernel. But, like, I wouldn't recommend that because um, it's always good to be, uh, like, though it's an open source, like, it's always good to have a common um, uh, a common uh, copy of a kernel. But uh, to solve that, luckily, we have a technology called eBPF, uh, which allows to send uh, which uh, which will um, help us to be able to inject simple kernel programs uh, based on uh, syscalls, syscall ev like syscall events. In, in fact, so I will give a brief introduction about like how this whole ABPF uh, looks like in the, in the next slide. Uh, so it's kind of like uh, a virtual machine inside a uh, inside a kernel that would run a sandbox programs within the within the Linux kernel. Like it's exactly like how we can. Imagine like you're uh, run a JavaScript within the web page. So uh, that's that's the whole analogy behind like how, like why do we use eBPF? So to give a, uh, and it, it avoids the need to make any major changes to the kernel. Um, advantages of eBPF would be like, one is mainly performance. Um, it provides a lot of advantages for performance because we are eliminating uh, here, like when, before I talk about performance, uh, when. Uh, the reason we're using, like when we start using eBPF uh, within the cloud native or Kubernetes cluster, uh, it will eliminate the need for using the Kube proxy altogether. So you don't, like once we have, for example, in this uh, uh, scenario, we take Cilium as an example. So with, when you're using Cilium, like it eliminates the need for uh, using the uh, Kube proxy. Uh, since we're uh, eliminating Kube proxy, it will also um, allow you to Get rid of IP tables, so you don't need to worry about IP tables. Like everything will be taken care of by Cilium in the in the backend. Uh, that's because again, like it's because we're using eBPF technology in the in the backend. 
So that's where like the performance comes into picture. And then uh, reliability, uh, like it's, uh, this way it is more reliable. Um, and it will make more room for debugging uh, your uh, your program. Uh, or like, uh, for example, like if you're, if you want to troubleshoot any networking packet, it will, it will make uh, your life more easy in terms of debuggability. And it's more compatible uh, since like we are running, we are able to run the sandbox program within the kernel. It's more compatible to implement this technology across uh, um, various uh, products. And uh, it provides a lot of room for customization as well. So I'll not I'll I'll, I'll stop here uh, around explaining about the advantages of EBP because like as I said earlier, it, th this itself is a technology that we can talk for for a whole day. And now uh, uh, to I'll just give a brief uh, understanding of how a whole EBPF works. For example, uh, uh, so a user uh, can write a little program in the language which is a subset of a C programming language, and then he compiles it. Uh, using this, uh, like using the C compiler, and then uh, it can load that particular program uh, into a, a JIT compiler, and uh, uh, that is within the net, uh, native uh, Linux, uh, like in the kernel space. And uh, once the uh, once these programs are compiled, uh, from like then it will go and create a, uh, a native code, and you know, like once. Uh, it creates a native code. It, it will then create a create something called as an BPF maps, and these maps are shared among different programs. Uh, this map can be accessed by process running in a user space, uh, and like EBP program. It, like again, as I said earlier, like EBPF programs are event driven. For example, here, like I am talking about a uh, event that has been injected into the EBPF. This is a, a network interface of your uh, Kubernetes node. And when, what, like, when this event, what happens here is like there's an event that is getting triggered uh, in the form of ETA, like the network interface. And so it means that uh, when that network interface gets a packet, uh, the following program will be executed. Like the, the BPF maps, uh, uh, the program will be ex executed, and those programs will be picked up by the BPF maps. And uh, in this scenario, like if the destination of the TCP packet that has been injected by the ETH0, uh, uh, contains the destination HTTP port uh, and the destination uh, address, then like it will pass on that particular packet to the uh, another interface. Like with here, in this case, like which is L six zero, which is the interface of the port. Uh, and if it contains, like it will pass on the packet to the uh, port interface. But like if it doesn't find that particular uh, HTTP port or it, if it doesn't find the destination, it will just drop the packet. So like it, it's it's that that easy um, or it, it's that simple like to uh, give a very uh, quick introduction or like just to give a very basic understanding understanding of BPF. Now uh, we talked enough about uh, eBPF. Like now let's uh, let's move on to understand like how we can uh, use eBPF. Um, uh, Cilium is one of the CNI uh, uh, that. Uh, is developed by isovalent and like again like when you're talking about implementing networking within AKS cluster uh, we have an option to uh, use uh, Azure's native uh, uh, CNI plugins uh, like Kubernetes. I'll come to the Kubernetes and uh, uh, Azure CNI later in the later part but like uh, Azure also provides an option for us to deploy uh, other third-party plugins so CLM is one of the one of the network uh, uh, plugin and uh, uh, Cilium is an open source project that will uh, provide networking, security, and observability in, in our cloud environment, uh, like such as Kubernetes. Uh, with the help of eBPF, uh, Cilium can inject network security policies uh, without any change to our application code. And uh, deploying Cilium requires to make sure that uh, we add the right attains to our nodes or to force any workloads. Uh, for the Cilium agent. So uh, we also need to disable the default container network interface, as I said, uh, as I earlier, earlier said, like, uh, again, like, it's uh, not logical to have uh, your traditional Kubernetes uh, CNI plugin and CNI uh, working uh, side by side, but like, you need to disable the container networking interface. Uh, Cilium uh, can be installed using uh, two options. You can use Cilium CLI to install the agent or uh, you can use uh, the Helm chart that is provided within Cilium 
uh, like as I show here, you can use Elm chart to install Cilium. Um, I will explain how do we do this during the demo part, but like I'll just go here in the flow, uh, trying to mention like um, how do we use or how do we integrate Cilium with uh, AKS. Uh, and uh, when you install Cilium, uh, or when you deploy Cilium, you will have several components that come along with uh, along with this uh, uh, plugin. Uh, one is the first one is the Cilium agent uh, that is deployed as a daemon set, uh, which is deployed across all um, nodes of a cluster. And uh, the Cilium agent here, the Cilium agent that will inject the BPF program to look at the network interface within the node. Um, on each node, uh, it will install a Cilium operator. Uh, that will manage uh, the various policies that we would like to apply in, in our cluster. And then like we use the Cilium uh, node in it that will run as a daemon set, again on each node, that, uh, that will handle the task uh, of mounting the eBPF programs uh, for each node and updating uh, the existing CNI plugin uh, to run in a transparent mode. And uh, last but not least, that the, the Cilium uh, CNI plugin uh, will basically trigger the necessary data path that will provide uh, how we enable network policies and uh, uh, our network policies for the pods. Um, uh, talking about networks and uh, network policy, uh, like once Cilium is deployed, uh, you can start managing your network policy on your cluster uh, using a CRD, again, provided by Cilium. Like again, here uh, we have, uh, you, can, you can tell, you can ask me uh, saying like, Kubernetes al already comes with a network policy on its own, but like how different is it? Uh, is, ECLM network policy from uh, uh, Kubernetes network policy. Uh, one example would be uh, like the network policy that comes with Kubernetes cluster has uh, very like has very li limited uh, functionalities and like it has limitations. So the Cilium network policy allow you to select a pod by using uh, the label selectors. For example, uh, here uh, when I look at the one of the example that I've given here, um, it, we will be using both uh, uh, level, level, uh, layer three and layer four uh, uh, network policies uh, to route traffic uh, at the layer three level, but also we'll be using another network policy to uh, route the traffic uh, at the level, layer seven, uh, 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 layer seven uh, of like of, in the networking stack. So here, uh, especially when we are working with the Cilium policy, uh, the way we would uh, define is uh, we would define the uh, endpoint because uh, the Cilium works on endpoints uh, uh, and the endpoints has been uh, uh, mapped to each service. So here uh, in this example, like we are uh, defining the, uh, uh, defining this policy to uh, allow uh, uh, ingress traffic from a pod called client uh, to uh, another pod within, the, within the, another namespace. And here is the next policy that uh, uh, will provide more of a layer seven uh, example, where like it will, it will, it is allowing us to enable the egress traffic to flow out of uh, the cluster to outer outer world. Um, Cilium comes with uh, uh, multiple CRDs again. Like we have Cilium cluster wide policy, uh, we have uh, the Cilium endpoint, uh, we have the Cilium external workload, uh, the Cilium identity, and the Cilium network policy and the uh, Cilium node, but like uh, out of all this uh, CRDs, like we'll be mainly using Cilium uh, cluster-wide policy and we'll be using uh, net, uh, Cilium network policy uh, in a common uh, use case. So uh, the cluster policy uh, is very similar to the network policy, only the difference is the cluster policy is similar to, uh, like uh, it will target the entire cluster uh, instead of a specific uh, pod. And instead of like when you're defining a uh, policy using the cluster policy, you normally select a pod based on the, you'll not, instead of selecting the pod based on the labels, you'll be selecting uh, the uh, pods based on the, the, the entire node. And uh, Cilium will automatically create a, a Cilium endpoint. It will have one Cilium endpoint created uh, for each service uh, managed by the Cilium uh, with the same name and in the same namespace. Uh, in fact, you can also uh, see the various Cilium endpoints by using C uh, Cilium uh, CLI. Uh, you'll create uh, Cilium will also create Cilium nodes for each node managed by Cilium within the Kubernetes cluster. So one small node uh, Cilium will manage uh, all services that are configured in the host 
uh, name that is equals to uh, uh, that is equal that uh, uh, that is equals to false. So uh, Cilium provides um, many advanced networking feature to manage uh, manage a cluster, uh, which is required, which again requires enabling multiple extensions extensions here. Um, now, like it's uh, that's all about Cilium to give a, a very quick uh, uh, description of uh, the, the this particular uh, third part, like the network uh, uh, CNET plugin. Uh, now let's jump it. Let's quickly jump into uh, the traditional uh, Azure Kubernetes service, and uh, uh, let's uh, here let's look at uh, the default uh, networking standards provided within Azure Kubernetes service. The first one is KubeNet. Uh, with KubeNet, what happens normally is um, uh, you only manage uh, the networking for your uh, node networking. So, for example, here your pod networking is all managed by within the cluster. So when you go and open up a, a cluster that has been deployed using KubeNet, you can see that the, the, the pods uh, side ranges are already being managed by uh, the Kubernetes cluster. And you can see those so pods uh, side ranges. Um, for example, like here, I've deployed a Kubernetes cluster that is using a KubeNet uh, CNI plugin. And you can see that like, uh, the pod uh, side ranges. You can see the pod, pod side ranges because uh, this is managed by the cluster, uh, and you don't uh, you don't you don't need to manage manage this and like you not have control on this. But like you have an option to manage the uh, node side ranges and the service side ranges. Again, like this will fall into your uh, regular uh, VNet that you create. So here the one thing you need to uh, think about is like when you when you're designing, like you worry about designing the networking for your nodes, but like you you'll not uh, be much worried about uh, designing the network for your pods. Like it will be taken care by uh, the cluster itself. But the problem uh, here is uh, you, you'll not have much control on the pod networking. And like it is good to have these set up uh, for a smaller size clusters, but like it will not be much helpful like if you're looking at deploying or designing a larger cluster. So that's where, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I didn't show the, I was looking at the screen here. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this is a product like the live uh, Kubernetes cluster. You can see that the, you have well, like we're using the network, Kubernet net, uh, network plugin, and we have uh, the port side ranges. Uh, since like it is we manage uh, internally, you can see the port side ranges here. But uh, for ex when we talk about the next CNI plugin that is being offered by uh, Kubernetes, which is an Azure CNI plugin. Here, what happens is, uh, okay, again in KubeNet, the way the traffic flows is uh, through NAT, uh, but when we use CNI, Azure CNI plugin, uh, here you will get uh, control on how do you um, um, design the networking for pod, as well as the networking for uh, your nodes and service as well. And uh, when you're using Azure CNI, you don't need to, um, uh, uh, you'll be uh, looking at designing the networking for both your pod uh, ranges as well as for your uh, uh, node uh, node side ranges as well. And like uh, when using Azure CNI, you don't need to uh, worry about uh, using the NAT rule. Like it uses uh, the bridge uh, within the node to route traffic to the pod. And and your pod network or your pod side ranges and the node side ranges, everything will fall within the same virtual network that you create. Uh, this is more about uh, the AKS cluster, and like uh, I, I don't have the uh, uh, cluster that is built using the uh, CNI uh, the CNI plugin. Like I only have a cluster that I built using the um, KubeNet. Uh, sorry, give me a minute. Let me uh, pull up the. screen that I'm showing I'm trying to show the yep uh, I'll, I'll move on. So for the demo, 
think I need some help. Uh, I need to pull up this uh, window. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's one of these in a different cap. Yeah, uh, here is a uh, uh, traditional AKS cluster that we deployed using kubelet. And uh, you can see, as I explained earlier, like you can see the uh, pod side ranges. And like it's no, it, it contains a normal networking. Uh, now, let me move on to uh, the AKS cluster that uh, I built using the CNI plugin. So when when we use uh, when we're using CNI uh, network plugin, uh, we have uh, three options that we that we get not, that we normally get. You can use uh, either uh, bring your own CNI uh, deployment while using the uh, the Cilium plugin. Uh, you can also uh, have an option to uh, within you can have an option within Azure uh, uh, Azure AKS networking where it will also provide an option to uh, build a plugin that is. AKS Azure CNI uh, powered by Cilium. Uh, and then like you have a third option, which is a, a plugin that has been provided by Isovalent itself, which is a Cilium enterprise by Isovalent. The main difference between these three are uh, with uh, bring your own CNI, uh, when you install a plugin with uh, bring your own CNI, like it will provide more options. But the disadvantage here is like, you'll not be able to integrate um, more of options between AKS cluster and your uh, CNI plugin. Uh, but when you're using AKS Azure CNI powered by Cilium, uh, that's where like it will provide more integration into your AKS cluster, but like it will not provide you um, an option of utilizing all the uh, features that has been provided by uh, Cilium CNI. Um, I'll not talk much about Cilium Enterprise by Isolent here, or like this uh, table um, that is provided here. This will give uh, more of information about like uh, uh, about various options that has been provided by all these three uh, various plugin options. Uh, when, we are, when, we are, when we are using uh, Azure CNI powered by Cilium, like we only get the normal, we only get normal container networking. Uh, we'll be able to work with Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes network policies and services and with the collaborative, uh, like, but you'll not be able to uh, utilize uh, much of other uh, features that have been provided by, the, by Cilium, that is, uh, the main thing is we will not be able to use uh, the uh, observability that is provided by Hubble uh, plugin, and we'll not, also not be able to use the Cilium network policy, and we'll not be able to use uh, the ingress and uh, other advanced features of Cilium. Um, let me uh, start with a quick demo. Uh, here, let me minimize this. And I have built another cluster uh, within uh, that utilizes uh, uh, Cilium uh, plug network plugin. Here you can see, uh, uh, like as I explained earlier, like when we're building the CNI, uh, when we're building a AKS cluster using the CNI plugin, we normally select. Uh, uh, we we'll normally select. Uh, not to use any network plugins because uh, we will install Cilium after we deploy AKS cluster. Uh, so here you can see that like you don't have the plugin here, uh, which mentions that like you, uh, it is none. And you can also see that like uh, we are not deploying the pod side ranges. Uh, we only uh, have the networking, uh, 
mentioned for the service side ranges and like we will not have the networking defined for our nodes as well for example like if i uh, go and uh, query this cluster uh, 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 this is a cluster that uh, I'm building. You can see uh, I'm using this as a cluster. Is it the right one? Yeah. TFK itself. And when you look at the node status, you can see that. Uh, uh, the status is not ready because uh, this doesn't have the IP address uh, uh, for the nodes. Uh, if I go wide, can see uh, uh, though there are IP address, but like the status is not, it's still not ready because it, it doesn't have the IP address that has, it doesn't have CMI configured for it. So let's go and uh, install uh, Cilium. For this, uh, let me use a CLM. Uh, install the plugin. So all I'm saying here is to uh, use this resource group. So it will auto detect uh, the cluster that's available in the resource group. And I'm installing Cilium CMI for the AKS cluster that I just show, showed now. And yeah, once this is installed, let's check the status of Cilium. That I use uh, our Cilium status to check uh, if I'm able to see all the uh, if the Cilium um, CMI is enabled. Like I see an error. I think like it's still building the uh, pods for the Cilium. Now I can see all the ports are up and running. So let, let me go back and check. So the status. Yeah, now I can see that Cilium is installed. Uh, and now we have Cilium CMI enabled on the cluster. And let's go back and see if I'm able to uh, uh, see the look at the, uh, look at the status of uh, the nodes and see if, if it is ready uh, to accept the uh, new pod. So, like, as you can see, like you can see that like uh, the status for the nodes are ready. Now let's go and deploy um, a few uh, deploy an application onto onto uh, onto our cluster. Uh, before I deploy the uh, uh, deploy an application, let me also go and enable. Uh, Hubble uh, observability to uh, to work with observability. For that, I will say As it is enable, enabling the hub, let me open up my another terminal and let me prepare for the deployment of application. Like this is a very basic application uh, which uses uh, ingress uh, Nginx image. 
uh, the like the design of this application which i would like to show here would uh, look like this like we have a aks cluster here and we have we'll be working with three namespaces one is basics namespaces and we'll have a pod in each namespace we have another namespace called client we'll have we'll be running a client pod here in the in this client's namespace and also we'll be using the test pod in the default namespace to um, inject traffic into basics uh, pod and we'll use uh, hubble observability to understand like how the traffic flows uh, within within these uh, namespaces so let's start installing the application yeah we have the hubble uh, agent enabled as well let me check the status So now we have uh, Hubble Relay Agent that's installed. Um, uh, with CLM, like you will, along with Hubble, uh, Hubble comes with a, a command line uh, called Hubble itself. Like we can use both Hubble CLI as well as uh, a GUI based uh, uh, application as well, which will provide a more uh, reliable uh, way of analyzing the traffic. For that, we need to enable Hubble um, UI. Let's go and enable that. So while this is enabling, uh, while we're enabling the UI, let's go back to other terminal and like let's start deploying and uh, deploying our basic application. Here, let's I'll do is I'll instead of typing commands, I'll just copy paste. Deployments and let me also install the service for my application. So this has created a created this namespace uh, basics and I have installed the uh, basics pod and also I'll set up the basic service for the networking purpose. So when I go back here and when I check the car, the objects installed in the basic namespace, I can see I got my pod deployed. I can I got my service deployed. I also have the external IP uh, because. I'm deploying this uh, workload on a AKS cluster. So I normally, I, by default, I'll get the load balancer IP. Uh, I'll also get the, I also uh, got my deployment deployed here. Let's go back to our uh, other terminal and see if the UI is uh, enabled. Mm, status. Yeah, now we have our Hubble UI. We also have our Hubble Relay. Um, how do we, uh, before we start using uh, the Hubble observability, uh, let's go and enable, uh, like we need to enable the port forwarding to communicate, uh, to have the Hubble communicate and visible on the on my local system. For that I will say port forward. So this will uh, allow me to analyze the traffic and also here, I'll also enable Hubble UI. And yeah, we have the GUI enabled. When you click on basic uh, namespace, you can see that my uh, basic pod in the namespace has been deployed here. And it has a connectivity from internet because I'm I have deployed this pod on AKS cluster. Now let's go back and uh, look at how our application is. Uh, yeah, let's start. Let's now go back and inject some traffic or enable some traffic into these pods. 
uh, let me bring back this. So now, uh, uh, um, the next in the next step, uh, what I'm going to do now is um, I have the basics pod here. Uh, let me uh, see. Uh, let me inspect this traffic and let me uh, create a test pod and let me try to uh, send some traffic from my test pod to basics basics pod. Uh, before I send the traffic, let me copy the contents of this because I would need this later. And now let me go and create a test pod. Uh, yeah, it's a normal uh, Nginx pod, uh, which which I would use to send traffic to my basic pod. So let me check if uh, my pod is running. Since it's in default namespace, uh, yeah, I got my pod running. So now let me start. Okay, before this, let me uh, try to see what traffic is uh, available in in my uh, default names uh, like in my default namespace. I can see that like uh, there is multiple like there there is a traffic that is being generated with, generated within, within my cluster. Uh, I would not much worry about this for now. Uh, let me explain this in detail as I go through defining the traffic. Uh, so now let me uh, add some. Tra uh, okay, before this, let me pull up the IP address from my from my pod. I need the IP address mainly on the name. Okay, um, let me copy this IP address. And let me uh, generate some traffic here. I can see I'm able to generate traffic. And here, uh, to inspect how my traffic is being flowed, like uh, to inspect how my traffic is being generated, like as, like how my traffic has been routed, I'm routing traffic from my test pod to basic pod. And how do I observe it? I will use, to, to observe it, like I'll use uh, the able command, say able, uh, able observe and I will Here I need to change the name of the pod. What I'm doing here is I'm trying to say I'm trying I'm looking at observing traffic that is being uh, flowing from the test pod that is to uh, uh, from test pod and uh, to the basic pod basics uh, pod or basic deploy pod. So let's go and see if it is able to uh, locate the traffic. Yeah, you can see that I can see that like the traffic is being forwarded. Uh, yeah, and it has been generated. And like uh, this is more of in a CLI, but like when I go and look at the uh, look at my C, uh, the UI, let me see if I'm able to um, visualize the traffic within the UI. Yeah, you can see that 
uh, from my de default namespace, it's able to pass the traffic to the basic deploy namespace. Uh, this is about, like this is about uh, generating this traffic from test pod to basic. Now let's start implementing the actual network policies, CLM network policies. Here, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to restrict the ingress traffic to basic pod. Uh, for that, I have created a, a, a Cilium policy where I will deny the ingress uh, to to the base, to the basic pod. Uh, again, like as I explained during my session, like uh, in the in the beginning, uh, it, every service is based on the endpoint, and like the endpoints are based on the uh, selectors, and like we select the pods based on selectors. So here, uh, when I implement this uh, Cilium network policy. Uh, it should, uh, for me, it should uh, disable uh, traffic that is flowing from default pod or default namespace to my basics pod in the basic in the basics uh, namespace. Yeah, yeah I got my uh, policy implemented. Let me go back to my. UI to see, okay, I'm not able to visualize much here, but let me run my command uh, that I ran earlier and see how the traffic flows within the CLI. Some issue with the policy that is implemented. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, it's showing for it because, like, I didn't uh, try to uh, generate the traffic, so let me generate the traffic. Let me generate this traffic now. And with this, it should fail now. Uh, let's see if it's going to fail. Yeah, you know, it says like it's not able to establish. It's the, uh, it terminated. And now let's go and uh, check the, uh, let's go and observe the traffic. And we can see that uh, here, uh, it's denied because like we have implemented the policy to uh, disable ingress. And we can see uh, the policy drops. And once, let's go back to the UI and let's refresh this and see if we are able to see a packet drop. Yep, you can see that the packets are dropped. Uh, it's about uh, pod to pod. Uh, now, um, let's look at the next steps. Uh, now, let me create a, a sample, uh, another pod. Uh, in another namespace, and uh, with this, I'm going to create a new policy uh, to uh, allow traffic from client pod to the uh, basic pod. So, like, it'll still hold uh, the uh, ingress deny to the basic pod, but like, uh, we will cre uh, create a pod and like, we'll create uh, implement another uh, ingress pol uh, Cilium policy to allow traffic uh, to specific two pods. Or two namespaces. So for that, uh, let me start creating a new namespace in the pod. Uh, yeah, it's created and let me generate some traffic from here. Yeah. Yeah. 
should be able to receive the traffic. Yeah, uh, it's failing because like uh, my, my ingress design is still active. So let me go and um, enable my, create another Cilium policy. Uh, what this will do is it will go and enable uh, uh, us to allow traffic from the client port to the Cilium port. So let me implement this one. I have implemented the traffic to allow uh, the traffic from uh, the clients to basics. Let's generate some traffic here. And now you can see that it's, it's passing through. I am able to send the traffic uh, from, uh, from this clients to uh, basics. And let's observe uh, how it's traveling. Uh, like, uh, is it um, allowed in the um, within uh, within Hubble? Report here it would be sort of test port should be client. Now we can see that uh, we're able to see the traffic forwarded from client to basic spot. So. Yeah, this is how you control um, uh, your traffic. You, you implement ingress within your pod uh, network and within your uh, namespace network. And uh, you use Hubble CLI as well as Hubble UI to uh, monitor the traffic. And when I refresh this, you can see that, now you can see that there is, a, a, the traffic has been blocked to uh, the basic uh, pod from, uh, from the default pod. So this is about ingress, implementing ingress policies. I'm just trying to see. Yeah. Okay. So now let me quickly go and uh, deploy uh, egress policy um, to enable traffic from our uh, basic pod, which is within Kubernetes cluster to outside world. For that, uh, like by default, like you will have uh, the egress enabled. So let me go and dis disable egress first. And let's observe traffic that has been generated. Um, instead of client, I will Just while Babu is running that command, uh, anyone got any questions for him? You got a pair of socks up for grabs if you've got a question. I like that graphical interface. Can I get the socks if I ask you what that graphical interface was? I'm sure you talked about it and I just wasn't in the room. That's showing the flow. Yep. That one. Here's a question for the audience. What's, the, what's that? Is that a package? Hubble, Hubble, what did you say? Hubble, is that what it is? Yeah, Hubble. Correct. All right, there we are. Hubble UI. Socks, yeah. socks for this gentleman here. Hubble is an uh, observability yeah. in Cilium. Everyone wants the pair of function socks. All right, I'm going to just shut up, uh, let Babu finish uh, this section, uh, and then we're going to wrap up. And uh, this room will be for the next session. Sorry to talk over your session, Babu. Um, uh, we'll do uh, reliably well architected in here with John. 
and next door will be PowerShell and GPT uh, with Darren. Uh, both good sessions, depending on what you're trying to get out of today. Uh, and then after that, we'll have our lock note in here with Jesse talking about uh, using GitHub Copilot with Azure policies. So, uh, Babu, back to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I created an egress policy, and I can see that uh, I'm not able to uh, connect to google.com. And uh, I'll not run the Hubble uh, CLI. It should be, let's go to uh, the UI and see if we're able to see the traffic that's pulled out to Google. And it is not, I'll not waste much time. I'll deploy the egress allow uh, policy and we'll wrap up from there. Now, since I deployed the egress policy, uh, it should be uh, able to solve uh, access to Google. So if I go back to my UI, I should be able to see it's able to reach Google from here. Was, um, over there. Yep, it's able to reach traffic to Google. Uh, yep, uh, I'll conclude my presentation here. And like this is how uh, we can integrate uh, AKS cluster with third-party CNI. Uh, again, like CLM is one of the CNI that uses eBPF, and using these uh, ad like advanced uh, CNI plugins that is using used with eBPF would provide more options for you to uh, uh, customize and uh, provide better networking and observability. Cool, thank you. Uh, 